Good morning. And in case I don't see you later, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to Flat Earth UK Live. Joining me tonight is a man who needs little introduction. Mark Sargent, welcome to Flat Earth UK Live. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, the pleasure is all my mark, most certainly. On tonight's show, we will discuss the very real possibility that we live inside a Truman Show style enclosed structure and that the powers that should not be and NASA have lied to us about the very nature of the ground beneath our feet. We're told we live on a spinning globe. Mark Sargent, can you tell us how you found out we are in fact stationary and flat? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It, would, it started in the middle of summer, I'm sorry, summer of 2014. I had been looking at a whole bunch of different conspiracies and was kind of bored with the, the regular stuff. I mean, I know I, I, I take all conspiracies seriously, but there was one that kept go going in front of me that I completely ignored and everybody does. Everybody that's in conspiracies, we all know about the flat earth. We've all heard of it and we've all dismissed it because it's ridiculous. It's insane. It's, it's utter... Uh, it cannot be possibly true. And I got a hold of a couple of YouTube videos, one from a guy in Germany who was talking about the flight paths in the Southern Hemisphere. And I, I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. And then, of course, I got a hold of the Matt Boylan video where he, you know, the, the, the iconic one where he's sitting down on the couch, his girlfriend's interviewing him, and he's talking about how he worked for NASA when he was 25 years old and that they told him during a, a kind of a little pro a party on the East Coast that the GPS system didn't work in Antarctica because it was flat. And I thought, wow, that's a great story. I love that story. I'm going to disprove this story because there's no way it could be real. I mean, again, he, he tells it pretty well. And, and uh, you know, for a sci-fi or a, a movie of the week or something like that, I, I think it's pretty cool. But there's no way it could be real. And so I sat down for the next nine months and went over just about everything I could. And, and every road I went down when it came to trying to snuff out the flat earth, I kept running into dead ends, which meant some, and I, I kind of change it up along, along these lines, is that there should have been overwhelming amounts of scientific evidence, huge piles and stacks of things, uh, tons of videos, tons of pictures. It should have been tens of thousands of pictures thousands of hours of videos and all these things that should have been there, but I could just open up one box, dump it out and say, well, that's the end of flat earth. And every time I dumped out a box, there was nothing there but packing popcorn and not even much of that. And so after a while, I started getting more and more frustrated because I, you know, I was going through all the boxes and finally when I got to the end, I, I turned around and it was just a bunch of cardboard. And I started realizing, wait a minute, how do I know it's a globe? How, you know, how my next question, why do we think we're on a globe? Exactly. How, which was the question I put when I, uh, when I, when I built the flat earth clues back in February of 2015, I put the question out there. It's like, how do you know you're on a globe? Because how I know seems to be the same reason that everybody else knows, which is kind of weird because with a lot of things that we know in life, we all find out different ways. But when it comes to what the, what the earth is, where you are now, we all kind of answer it in two different ways. And the first is always the same, which is, well, duh, we know. It's obvious. It's, it's like just fire, obvious the globe. Fire, fire, fire burns, water is wet. That's something that has to do with gravity or at least a name that we call it gravity. It pulls it to the ground. But with the earth, it shouldn't be, it's not like that. We all equate it to those things. The earth is round, we assume it. It's like, well, it does, it's round. But it's like, well, how do you know that? It's, well, because we saw the globe when we were growing up as children. It's like, yeah, okay, how else do you know? And then he said, well, eventually they, everybody comes back to the same thing. It's like, well, I saw the picture in the textbook. I saw the picture here. I saw the picture, I saw the poster on the wall. And it's like, okay, if the picture is on the wall, where did it come from? It's like, well, NASA showed us. And, and, they, and I say, well, so you believe them. You believe them wholeheartedly. And, and they go, yeah, we, we believe them. NASA wouldn't lie to us. They're, uh, you know, they wear white uniforms. They don't carry guns. They smile on camera. They seem to be a fairly benign organization similar to Starfleet. I go, okay, that's great and all, but they've only so shown you one picture. And, and I'm not kidding you when I say this. And, and I, I know some people say, oh, you're beating a dead horse. No, no, this is very, very important. And that is literally from 1972 to summer of 2015, last year, there was exactly one full picture of the Earth in sunlight. And we've all seen it. It's the, you know, the bottom part of Africa uh, and all of Antarctica, and it's mostly cloudy. 
you I mean, got to. I was going to a bit later on maybe talk a little bit about composites. But oh, I was hoping yeah. maybe maybe uh, to talk about a little bit about composites maybe a bit later on. But before okay. that, I was yeah. hoping to get a bit of your insight on Operation Fishbowl. Ah, yes, Operation Fishbowl. Uh, th yeah, that was a that was a little side note when I was doing the research, and that was when uh, because every road I went down led into places that I didn't think I'd be going, uh, like for example the aqua uh, the Azimuth Equidistant Map or Admiral Byrd's missions down to Antarctica, even though he's known for the Hollow Earth, even though he spent most of his life looking for something down in Antarctica and then dying one year later after discovering it. You know, don't think it's a coincidence there, but how things change, the big sweeping changes that happens in our world starting in 1956. One was high altitude nuclear testing, uh, starting from 1958 until 1962. And it combined the United States and the then Soviet Union, uh, U the USSR, where they were both, not only were they ramping up their rocket production very, very quickly, but they were attaching atomic weapons to them and they were firing straight up from altitudes anywhere from supposedly 50 kilometers to 400 kilometers and detonating some really big shots up there. You got to remember that uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those were only 20 t kiloton weapons. And these guys were firing up megaton weapons. That's a thousand kilotons, you know, at megaton weapons up in the sky. And they were doing it on a regular, these are the only two countries that could even do it in the world. And they were both just hammering, just hammering the sky. And, uh, it didn't, and one of the packages, at least on the American side, the Russians don't name it as creatively as we do, but one of the packages of atomic weapon, high altitude and atomic weapon testing for the Americans was called Operation Fishbowl, which was a series of shots that I think was done in 1959, 1960. I, I, I'd have to look it up just to make sure. But it was fascinating because why would you name high altitude nuclear testing uh, that package, why would you name it Operation Fishbowl? It didn't, it didn't make any sense. It was hiding in plain sight. And that was, I fully believe, not only were they trying to, to test the integrity of the firmament or the dome or whatever you want to call it, but they were also trying to map out the sky. And that was after the first few shots. You can look this up if you get a chance. The first few shots were upwards of over three megatons, which is massive, especially for 1958. Did this come directly after Operation High Jump? No, no. Operation High Jump, and, and it's, they're easily confused. The Operation High Jump was an interesting was an interesting side note, and people have asked me about Operation High Jump a lot, which was Admiral Byrd, you know, the youngest uh, admiral in the history of the United States Navy, probably our greatest explorer of all time. He kept doing missions down to Antarctica starting in 1928. So he does the North Pole in 1926 in a rickety plane because you know we didn't have very good planes in 1926 no pressurized cabins to, by a long shot so in 1928 he starts doing missions down in antarctica again looking for something so whoever was paying him was paying him well and he had complete control plus he flew his own planes he kept doing his thing down there but they had to take a break during world war ii nobody was down there in antarctica during world war ii except one group and you can probably guess who that was that was the nazis the nazis were down there during world war ii why well, you know, watch Indiana Jones, the movie. They were everywhere. They were looking for anything they could as an advantage. And if there was something secret and cool happening down there, that's where they were going. So the rumor was that they had a base down there and that the, the Nazis had camped out wherever, whatever they were using down there, they weren't going anywhere. They were sort of entrenched even after the war had ended, you know, because the war in Europe was ended in what, 1943, 44, something like that. I can't remember when, when uh, VE Day was. But it didn't really matter because in 1946, after we had uh, the you know the Allies had wrapped up everything, including the uh, the, the Japan stuff, Admiral Byrd led a full blown carrier fleet that was used in World War II. Uh, you know, 5,000 men plus men, uh, you know, support ships, the whole nine yards down to Antarctica in 1946, called Operation High Jump. To this day, we don't know exactly what he was trying to root out down there. Was it the Nazis? Was it tied with alien technology? Were things shot down? I don't know. But all I can tell you is that from the time, you know, after it was over, because it was over fairly quickly, you know, when he finally did that, 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 that great television interview in 1954, whatever it was done was done in 1946 during uh, um, High Jump was taken care of. 
because he didn't mention it. He didn't seem to be worried about it. And by 1954, it was all about the corporations. It was all about so, let's, was the chronoscope, the chronograph. What was it? The, called? Yeah, it's the, the show. And I pronounced it wrong. And the clue is, unfortunately, because it's way before my time. Well, not way before, but before my time. It was called the Long Jeans Chronoscope, which is kind of like an equivalent to like a 60 Minutes show. Sure. Where, where you had some some high level journalists on there that were talking to him, and yeah, when he comes on in 1954, he didn't have a care in the world. It was like, oh yeah, we're just going to go down there and make money. Everybody's set up to to down there. Um, United States, Great Britain, uh, the Soviet Union, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, Australia. They're all down there. We're all getting ready. And in fact, he was even worried. He mentioned during the interview, he's going, man, I hope we don't end up fighting over the resources. And then, and even, and he, he goes down and he, and he says that, oh yeah, we're, we're prepping for uh, the next mission, which happened to be the very next year, which was 1959, 56, which happened to be the last official mission, Operation Deep Freeze. And then whatever happens during Operation Deep Freeze, that's when it all changed. And I believe that is after almost 30 years of flying around looking for the ends of Antarctica, the ends of the world, that's when they found it. So and where does the Antarctic Treaty come? It, almost immediately afterwards. So if Operation Deep Freeze ends in 1956, they start working on legislation immediately to where it became ironclad in 1959. So all again, all these weird moves. So so the, the treaty ends in 1956, and then for whatever reason, the Soviet Union and uh, the United States ramp up their rocket program in 1957 right away. They start firing nukes. 1958, after like the third shot, NASA is formed immediately after the third shot, which makes sense because it's like, okay, megaton weapons are not doing anything up there. We've got to control the sky starting now, which, okay, how do you control the sky? Well, we're going to have to come up with a space program. And NASA then became the gatekeeper. Um, 1959, NASA, announced the, NASA announces the Van Allen radiation belts. It's coincidentally, the same year they announced the Van Allen radiation belts, which says, oh, by the way, nobody should ever go up there because it's super dangerous and lethal. Uh, oh, yeah, and by the way, we're, uh, we're sealing off Antarctica forever. Nobody pay attention to that, though. And those two things, you're sealing off the upper edge and the outer edge simultaneously. That, for me, uh, just screamed structure. Not only that, but you, know, you combine that with the fact that it goes against everything that we are as a capitalistic civilization where greed and power and money rule the world. And you're telling me that no corporation, no matter how much money they have, not only cannot go down and, and do any work in Antarctica, but they aren't even allowed to legislate. You know, they aren't even allowed to lobby. I joked about it the other night where I said, look, if I owned Exxon Mobil, how hard would it be to go to my friends at the New York Times and run a weekly piece? every week and say, here's why just it's lobby, good. For, lobby and lobby. Yeah, yes. Here's why it's good for Exxon to be in Antarctica. Here's why it's good for, they already, why isn't anybody doing that? Because they can't, because when you're at that high level, you want to do it. And then somebody from national security, who's kind of monitoring what you're doing anyway, comes to you. I'm sorry, from the DOD comes to you and says, oh yeah, by the way, uh, it's a matter of national security. We're not going to tell you what's going on there, but it's super secret. Just stay away. And I mean, you've, to bring you back on, you've, made the assumption from them locking down Antarctica and locking down the sky yes. that they're, well, they're doing exactly that, they're locking it down. But that kind of implies that we know where we are. So would you assume from that that the powers that should not be have a, a really accurate representation of our world? Or to put it more succinctly, have our, has, our map, has our world been mapped out? I think they know a lot. Okay. There's a couple ways you could you could talk about this, and I know there's been some uh, disputes when it comes to the mapping. I think before 1956, they had a pretty good idea, but unfortunately, because we didn't have the technology to do anything about it, honestly, without the internal combustion engine, who cares? Because you're not going to be able to reach the borders anyway. You just do not have the technology to do it. But once they got up high enough, uh, and I'll use the Matt Boylan line, you've got to get up high enough to figure out where you are. Once they figured out, it, at the very least, it's not a globe. Now, whether it has a barrier, a soft barrier, a hard barrier, are there more you know, places like this outside? We don't know. But what we can tell you is whatever the world really is, they have gone to extreme lengths to make sure we don't know about it. And most of it's because of omissions. You know, uh, again, well, why? Would, before the why, how? How do you hide it? How do you hide yeah, the world? How, how have oh, with, what, mostly with money more than anything else. And that is um, a series of negative reinforcements uh, that you can put under the cloak of national security uh, with, with Antarctica. That's easy. 
you know, you just, you know, you keep everybody in the loop, and that is all the countries that signed onto the treaty, and there's over 50 of them now, uh, you just, you put it under an environmental blanket and say, oh, it's pristine, it's for science, we don't want anybody down there, and that's fine now, or and that's, that, that would have been fine in the 90s, the 2000s, but in 1959, environmentalism wasn't even a word. You gotta remember, Greenpeace wasn't even founded until 1971, and that was just a couple guys in some tie-dye shirts and a raft. They didn't care about it. Antarctica they couldn't even have gotten there if they wanted to. So uh, you hide. So the Antarctic treat is one way with money, but the, the big money sink, that of course is creating NASA, creating all the space agencies, and then unfortunately spending billions, if in adjusted dollars, probably over a trillion dollars now to create basically, <laughs> again, I, mean, I got to steal from Matt on this one, which is you can't just hand people the picture. You know, that's the biggest, you have to create the most expensive fake picture of all time. And that is, how do you do that? It's like, well, you can't tell, you can't hand people a picture of the earth from space and say, oh, here's a picture of the earth from space. Because they're going to ask you, well, how'd you take the shot? So you have to create a rocket program to simulate the illusion of actually a real space program, which is why, by the way, why the Russians quit. A lot of people don't don't uh, remember that when the uh, uh, the Americans finally supposedly got to the moon in 1969, that the the Russian space program just threw it threw in the towel. I said, oh, that's it. They made it there first. Let's pack it up. Just shut it all down. And they never did anything ever. What? That's where the Cold War is going to end, right then and there? No, no, of course not. It would have been like, okay, how many people do the Russians have? How many? Of you, is there gonna? Is there a potential of a Cold War on the moon? Is it base against base? You know, are people knocking each other the flags over? No, it never happened. And you, again, you said, touched on this earlier when when you were talking about the one photograph. Yeah. Uh, now that's sort of buried in a million composites when you do a search. Mm -hmm. Um, but can you maybe talk us through what a a composite image is? And sure. B, how it's been used to convince us that we're on a globe. I mean, as, as an aside note, in your clues, you said that maybe with the rats or the mice example, that it explores its cage. And I was going to say, before we leave Antarctica or the Antarctica topic, is the Antarctic Treaty maybe a way of putting a cage in place? It, it is, but it's an invisible cage. Um, let me let me come back to that. Remind me of that question in a second. Okay. Uh, we'll a, a quick a quick backstory on uh, the composites versus what they pass off as an actual picture, sure. and that was because this again, you talk about hiding in plain sight. This whole concept was in front of my face fifteen years ago or sixteen years ago now in two thousand when I was trying to come up with some uh, background graphics for uh, all the computers in the tech support department, which I ran, and that was okay. I want some pictures of the earth. That's kind of, it's the iconic thing, right? So I go online and granted it's, it was thinner then than it is now, but I'm, I'm typing in, uh, you know, the earth from space. Earth from space. Yeah. The earth from space. And literally row, you know, now, now you get at least different variations, but back then it was literally one picture over and over and over again. It was just in different resolutions and it was the Apollo 17 picture and I'm staring at this and I was pretty good at bullying strings. And so I was typing in all the different, you know, earth from space, satellite picture of the earth from space or space picture, your earth, earth picture. I just kept going on and it just kept popping up the same things. And I was just getting so irritated. I was going, NASA, you suck. How in the world do you have an internet presence this bad? I granted it was only 2000, but still there was a lot still going on, on the internet in 2000. So I, it didn't even occur to me, did not even occur to me why that happened. So flash forward uh, some years and uh, like, and you've, you've probably seen the video yourself where the guy, the very first iPhone, where the guy had, they want to do the same thing. It's like, oh, for the first iPhone, we should put a, a nice picture of the globe on the iPhone. That should be the startup picture. Yeah, they didn't like any of the pictures that were out there. They had to create a composite on their own to put on there. And they were and they worked with NASA to, to create the image. And it's like, oh, yeah, a composite. So people don't know what a composite is. It is a, exactly what it sounds like, and that is it's a composition. It is a series of pictures, different pictures, and some Photoshopping that's, you know, stitch it all together, and you can throw it out there as the real thing. But you have to tell people that it's composite. And there have been nothing but composites, and we know this because nothing but composites since 1972. So when, so even as little as like 2013, if you typed in the Earth from space, you'd see that picture, that Africa, Antarctica piece of crap. And then, oh, by the way, don't think that's a coincidence that you would show uh, the whole, the only continent that they showed in its entirety was Antarctica. 
I mean, right. this is an American space program. You're really not going to get a shot at the States? No, come on. It's, it's a bunch of crap. So there's all these composites all the way up until this year. And I'm sorry, all, all the way up until last year. And then for whatever reason, and uh, again, the Flat Earth Movement has got to take some credit for this because the NASA is dancing to our music, which is in the summer of 2015, they release a blue marble shot. And they kind of had to do what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, they had to, they couldn't just release it. They couldn't just say, oh, by the way, this shot, you know, they couldn't just sneak it into the internet, but they announced it. So NASA comes out and they said, oh yeah, by the way, this is the second blue marble shot we've ever taken in 43 years. Uh, nothing to see here. And the White House tweets it. Obama, I put it in one of my shows. He actually talks about it in a speech, not in the Oval Office, but in a different thing. And it's like, okay, you're admitting it, that you've only taken two shots of the Earth from space. And then, of course, it started rolling from there because then they released that kind of time-lapse thingy with the moon traveling in front of the satellite. Okay. Oh, yeah, by the way, here's a satellite at a million miles away that we forgot to tell you about. And here's the moon passing in front. I mean, honestly, that was abysmally bad production value. South Park could have done a better uh, moon in front of the Earth than, than they did. And then um, uh, just a couple weeks later, they did the, um, uh, the shot from the, the moon where they showed the moon surface, which basically was just the old JAXA footage. Uh, most people don't even remember uh, the JAXA probe, but I do, because uh, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, they supposedly sent HD cameras to the moon, circling around and come back. I was going, right, I remember when they launched. And I go, right on, they can take those HD cameras and they can finally do a full-blown shot when they're coming back to the Earth, and here's the Earth coming for you and getting bigger. Nope. Nope, the earth, the earth rises in the distance, they come up on it, and just, just barely getting into focus, and that's the end of the footage. And you never, you never heard about it, and then, you know, the Jacks ended up releasing it on YouTube, and I put that in a couple of things that it, it was just horrible. Production value is awful. So, hey, sorry, you, my... you talk about production value, which is bringing me nicely on to my next question, which is, how does the TV, and probably more than anybody, Hollywood, actually program us with the illusion of the globe? Oh, perfect. That's a, that's a great question. And by the way, he did not send me a list of questions. So if he blindsides me, you'll know, because I'll get kind of a frowny face. Anyway, so what happens is uh, Hollywood does it two ways. And it was my first clue. And I had to do it. And people said, oh, that was your weakest clue. I'm just going, no, it isn't. It's a preface clue is what it is. So Hollywood gets you in two ways. The first way is they reinforce you with just about every type of science fiction movie. Forget about your fantasy science fiction, like Star Trek and Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica. And you know, those are all fine and dandy. It's the pseudo movies that get you. And that is like, uh, and they did some a bunch of years ago, like uh, Mission to Mars, Red Planet, uh, the Gravity, The Martian, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where it's sort of pseudoscience. It's like the near future, or in Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey. Uh, all those movies, what they do is they reinforce the globe subliminally because what you're watching is it's like, it, does, it doesn't matter if you believe the movie or not, as long as your train of thought is out there somewhere. It's, oh, they're doing something on Mars. I'm on a globe. They're doing something on Saturn. I'm on a globe. Everything you say, and, and even even NASA is doing that to a certain degree, and that is, oh, the face on Mars. Doesn't mean doesn't matter if you believe in the face on Mars. That's not the goal. As long as you're thinking about the face on Mars, you're on a globe, which means there is space. And the second part that Hollywood does, which is, of course is a giant omission, is the fact, again, he doth protest too much, and that is they have gone way out of their way to make sure there has never even been a straight-to-DVD movie about the Apollo programs. Ever. There's only been two. Well, no, that's not quite true, is it? There was a, a special that was um, Tom Hanks from what was it, Earth to the Moon or something like that. Ah, yes, and I did cover that in the clues, but but it wasn't a made it wasn't a major Hollywood film. So let me, let me clarify. So uh, the greatest achievement in the history of mankind, and the first movie that was ever made about it was uh, uh, The Right Stuff in 1983. A great cast, astronaut recru recruitment movie. Very boring. Uh, but really boring. Well, it wasn't actually that boring. It made quite a bit of money. Well, it, it was an interesting story, but it was nothing to do with NASA. It was nothing to do with the moon. It. it was. It was. Yeah. It was like okay. Here's how we train the astronauts, and it was a great cast. Uh, one. You know. In fact, it lost. It would have won Best Picture, uh, believe it or not. But it lost to Gandhi of all things, and of course, Gandhi was going to win. But it was set up for the, perfectly for the sequel because after three hours, they were in low Earth orbit. It's like right on. You can use the whole cast, the whole production team. You can go right into the sequel. Never happened. And then they never, then there was just crickets until 1995, I believe, when Apollo 13 came Apollo out 13, yeah. with Tom Hanks and Kevin Bacon and uh, uh, Gary Sinise and Bill Paxton. 
And the, it, it, but that was set in a capsule. It was the only Apollo mission that didn't go do anything near the moon. It was like, oh, you know, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. It's like, oh, okay, whatever. And then after that, there was never anything after that, with the exception of the Tom Hanks production. No coincidence there, because he had done Apollo 13. He knew all the guys. He used some of the same crew. And they made a little documentary, and I watched the whole thing uh, um, uh, uh, from the Earth to the Moon. And I watched the whole 10-part series, and it was horrible. It was awful. And you're watching it, and you're just going, oh, my. In fact, even the, the, the making of was more telling than anything, because it showed you some of the special effects they were using. Uh, but the point was, is there's never been ever again not even straight to dvd and for those people do not quote me like moon the movie or uh, apollo 18 because there was no apollo 18 and that was about little crab monsters that were eating astronauts uh there's never been a movie made a major hollywood movie made about the apollo missions ever how how does that happen we if there is a nickel to be made in hollywood i mean for god's sakes they made a sequel to paul blart mall cop we make sequels to everything, and you can't even tell me that nobody's going to make even a failed movie. That's the big tell, and that is you know, what a studio isn't going to make a movie. It's not going to get shut down, and and it's not going to do anything. It's it's going to be in the DVD bin, straight straight to DVD, a B movie. There's not even one of those. How does that happen? Nobody gets the rights to this. And 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 uh, when Stanton Friedman, Friedman said during the the debate that I had with him, which was really more of a discussion, when he said, "Oh, they don't make the movies because it'd be boring. Nobody would watch it." I was going, "Oh." Don't you dare. Don't you dare use that logic. We make America, United especially. Achievements. I'd be glued to it. Oh, yeah. The United States makes a ton of crappy movies. You cannot tell me, especially the older generation. They would have eaten that stuff up, especially, you know, take your pick. You could have picked all sorts of actors to have been in. Actors would have lined up for that thing, which is why Apollo 13 had such a great cast. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, people just chomping at the bit. Anyway. I mean, we have a, a modern day version, if you want to call it that, uh, what? in the form of the ISS. Um, yeah. But you had a, a, a statement given to you, did you not, from an industrial valve and seal expert? Yeah, yeah. He came out, um, uh, and I still don't know his actual name. Or actually, I may do, but I, I think I deliberately forgot it. Where he came out, and he goes, look, he goes, there are not many companies. There's like five or six companies in the world that specialize in industrial seals and valves. And by that, he goes, especially when it comes to military contracts, uh, it's no different than the people that come up with the door seals and the valves for everything for like submarines because they have to be airtight. He goes, those same companies are the ones that have to supply, whether they're the high bidder or the low bidder, they're the ones that have to supply everything for the International Space Station. And the more he looked at the International Space Station, the more it just puzzled him. He's going, he was, he was how is this thing working? He's going from a SEAL standpoint, there are so many things wrong with the International Space Station. How is this thing staying up in the air? Why are these astronauts not in spacesuits constantly? Why aren't there constant repairs being made? Why isn't there a full-blown machine shop up there that's making, they're making parts uh, by, uh, you know, in, you know, all the time because they, they have to do swap out and maintenance. It's no different than uh, for people that don't know maintenance schedules for like aircraft, airplanes. Uh, it's different than cars. With cars, you can just wait till something breaks or wears out, and, and but you can't take a chance with airplanes. It's all based on date. So it doesn't matter if the part still looks good at three months, you're swapping that part out. And then after a certain number of time, you got to swap out a whole bunch of stuff simultaneously. And the severe penalties as well if they don't. Yeah. And he goes, where, and, and he goes with a space station, that's mission critical. He goes, where is the big swap out? Where are the parts? He goes, who's, and who's doing the maintenance? He goes, whenever you watch these guys that are doing the stuff in the international space station, you don't see anybody turning wrenches and, and do it. They should, he goes, they should be in suit. There should be a team up there constantly every day. In fact, the Navy guys were quick to jump on that which they said, look, the Navy ships, all the Navy ships and the submarines have full-blown machine shops, and every single day they are swapping parts out. They are constantly doing maintenance. He goes, the ISS, they apparently have no cares in the world after 15 years, and they're floating around. Uh, don't get me out going on a rant here, but the fact that they just they, they don't have a care in the world. It's khakis and polo shirts and socks all day long. Yeah. In fact, when you're when your countrymen, when, awesome. that, when the when the when the Brit went up there the other other month last month and they open up the hatch and he's coming in with khakis and and polo shirt and socks I was going, "What dress code is this? Why does not he wearing a suit? It's a hatch. You're going from from docking thing, you know, from a docking procedure. Is everything equalized? Is everything That's okay? It, is there a you don't know. No. Problem? Nah, he's in his khakis. He's all right. Oh my God. I just, I've watched this as going, and again, that was another dancing to the music bit because we were saying, uh, especially me, 
where I said that I go, look, look how the, um, the United Kingdom has completely avoided the space program. Why? Because they know better. They don't want to be a part of this. It's like, yeah, we're just, I, I loved, uh, and I don't know if you're a Bond fan, I love the, uh, the Sean Connery diamonds are forever scene from James still Bond. Talk us through it just because a lot of people may not have seen it, but it is comical. Just give us, just talk uh, us through it. We're, we're, it. He's running through, uh, it's Sean Connery. Uh, as James Bond, and he's running through, he's escaping the bad guys, and he's running through different Hollywood sets, and one of the Hollywood sets is a moon is a moon backdrop, where there's a capsule and a moon buggy, and these astronauts, right? And, and the guy in the control room, the guy going, get him, and the astronauts can't catch him because they're still in character, and they're running in slow motion, even though he's just running around him, they, and it's the big joke. That's the big jab, and he steals their moon buggy, and he leaves, and uh, that was the big joke, which was you know how easy is it to 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 fake the moon landing and uh it was very easy by comparison all you had to do was omit a few things so i, mean, I was going to maybe maybe come back to the the point i underlined earlier which was about um what? being being lab rats as a result of the antarctic treaty but i was going to kind of link that back into um maybe proof beyond richard bird and uh i mean is there any other people or references that you've had to give us an idea of the shape <sighs> Not really. I mean, the the stuff that we have to go off now is pretty limited. Um, I, I still like the fact that even though I know we're trying to redefine it and we're trying to redefine scale, and I know that uh, Tiger Dan has really been banging his head on the desk because he, he's been trying to rewrite the, the map and he's having a tough time with it. Uh, so I'm sorry if he's listening. Uh, I, I know it's not easy. But the fact that the UN flag, which is identical to the Azimuthal map, which is identical to the flat earth map. The UN flag was designed, it was finished in 1946. I thought that was very telling because I uh, get a member, Admiral Byrd was still looking in 1955. So that meant, let me know that whoever the powers that be, and by that, you know, the, the, the super rich, the royals and the, um, uh, and the governments, they had a pretty good idea. I think they had the old maps and they still do. But again, it just because I, I joked about this some months ago, which was it's just because you're the king of France in 1700 and you have an old map of what the world is probably looks like, what are you going to do about it? You got no way to, to, to prove it out for yourself. Yeah, you could send expeditions, but it probably wouldn't be the best idea to try to go out in Antarctica and wooden ships. So as far as the shape goes, you know, I still like, I still like the, uh, the UN flag, the azimuthal map on the ground, whether or not it's perfectly flat or it has warps to it. I uh, like the Orlando Ferguson map of the 1800s with, you know, the, the flat and stationary earth map. I think it's, I still think it's covered. I think it's covered with the dome. The, the arc of the dome is really throwing people because we don't know, uh, you know, is it shallow? Like a, like a sports stadium, like maybe only 500 miles high, or does it go up kind of like a snow globe? Is it several thousand miles high? Uh, I mean, also, we back to the maps. I mean, I'm, I'm interjecting a bit here, and I'll, I'll try and keep okay. it short, no, no, you're no, the no. Guest, of course. But I mean, from what I can establish, we've got is it um, Al Biruni and his map, which is about a thousand years old, yeah. and we've pretty much got an overlay of that that's been not changed massively. I know you're saying it has had alterations, but we've but pretty it, much had the same representation of flat earth for about a thousand years. Would, it, would yeah. it make sense to you that they would know that it's incorrect and hide it in plain sight so that we found an incorrect map and then only make accurate maps that wrap around balls? It's, it's possible. Uh, you know, the, the, the thought as of like last week was that, uh, you know, maybe the UN flag with its glaring omission of Antarctica, you know, Antarctica isn't on the UN flag, even though it should be. And people saying, oh, it's the only way you could draw the map of the UN flag. It's like, no, you couldn't. You could draw several different globes and put the Antarctica on one and then the other one would be fine. But yeah, I mean, it's possible. I still think it, when I stumbled across the Al Biruni thing, which was really, really interesting in my opinion, because again, if you look at the list of world map projections, on Wikipedia, again, none of this information is secret. You know, it was all, it's all out there. Anybody can check it, which is, again, why it's, it's been resonating so well. It was interesting that of all the projections that are on there, and there are a ton of them, that was the only one that had notations next to it. Like, everything else was, like, boring, boring, nothing happening, nothing happening. And this one, it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, the USGS uses it in its catalog, uh, and it's the UN flag, um, and it was designed by a thousand-year-old Persian scientist, uh, oh yeah, and it's tied to the flat Earth in some way. It's like there's like four things, and they're not small things. And that well, it's kind of like an orgy of evidence. It's almost well, it is too good to be true. It is, but at the same time, uh, I still believe, especially with the plane routes, 
uh, the plane routes was was a kind of a big thing for me, and that was, and, and it wasn't going to take you from this. <laughs> oh, okay. The plane routes was kind of a big thing for me, and that I didn't come up with it. And that was it was I can't remember if it was the German guy who came up with it first, but other people have noticed. I'm sure. In fact, I'm sure that anybody in the Southern Hemisphere has noticed, uh, especially since the. Um, uh, you know, I had that travel agent give me that statement where she, where if you're booking travel, you know, for a lot for people in the Southern Hemisphere, she was getting complaints every week. She's going, why, she said, why does it take so long to get from here to here? All we have to do is take a straight shot here. Why do we have to go all the way up to the Middle East? Why, why on the world, if you're going from Rio to Sydney, Australia, why are you going to Los Angeles? Or San Francisco, or Dallas, or any of these places, and 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 people say, "Oh, you're picking up passengers." I'm going to, and double the flight time, and triple the flight time. It, it didn't. It didn't. That was, you know, that was one of those things that I I was trying to work through. The one of the early things, and you don't know until you type it into any travel uh, site, and that is, if the flight should only take 12 hours, why do most of the flights take 40? You know, and, and you say there's like one nonstop, and the the other 50. Are connections and they're usually double connections and triple connections. There was a couple that were like they took fifty-two hours. It's going no nobody. It doesn't take three days to get anywhere. You know, not for a major airport. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. But the flights were very very interesting because again, on a flat map, those super arcing angles, which are which are usually on a globe or the Mercator map, they turn into those shallow dog legs or an exact straight line. Uh, and they don't, you know, what are the odds that that would happen? What are the odds that you would have a map projection that that's how they would, that's how they would line up? Uh, and, and some people say, well, it's a coincidence or it's just the way the project projections laid out. I was going, yeah, but there's too many, there's too many things. Let, let me put it this way. When I started getting into this after a while, I had to change my tune from how do I prove it's a globe to, I started playing devil's advocate and started right. saying, all right, if it was me, how would I hide the world? How could, could you do it? If you had to hide the world from the general, general population, could you pull it off? And between the flights and the, and the NASA thing and the Antarctica thing, I mean, they all kept pointing to the same thing. Uh, and, and if any one of those things would have pointed to something else, completely different, I would have said, okay, then we've got a problem here. But they kept pointing the same thing, and that is, you would do, why would you do that? You would do that to hide the world. And uh, one of the biggest ones was the flights in the Southern Hemisphere. And that is, you would, you would make as many connections as you could. Uh, if you didn't do connections, you would do those hidden fuel stops, which I think is intriguing. The fact that technically a nonstop flight is still a nonstop flight, even if you land, get fuel, but nobody comes on or off the plane. It's still considered a nonstop flight. And I thought that was brilliant. Uh, and then the third one, of course, was the, the GPS system, which I'm still getting people that come at me. They're incredulous. You know, they're, they're like, well, the GPS system's a land-based system. And of course, we're not going to track, we're not going to track all these things. I was going, yeah, but it's called a global positioning system. It was designed by the United States government. They don't do anything small ever. Uh, and they supposedly have 24 satellites that are circling the globe. If you have 24 satellites that are circling the globe and it's called the global positioning system and you have basically unlimited funds to spend on the system because the military would have a vested interest in tracking everything that flies, why are the three biggest oceans in the world not tracked? You know, and that being the South Atlantic, the South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. Why, why would you not track these things? Uh, and it, they're glaringly not tracked. I mean, they, they're not even hiding it to where, I mean, I, I joked about it. It's like, look, I've got some solutions for you at least. Fake some fake some latitude and longitude. Don't don't show the plane just blinking off. And then when you when you look up the plane, it says, "Oh yeah, by the way, we're approximating its its location or estimating its location." Oh yeah, by that, those planes they disappeared. Uh, don't worry about those. It was incredible. So sorry, I'm, I'm the, the, the world I've had a lot of tea. is given to us um, pretty much by the map makers and the USGS. But you've um, correct me if I'm wrong. You've spoken to surveyors. Can you sort of tie those two concepts? The USGS. Oh yeah, the based? survey. I had a, a slew of people call me uh, at the end of 2015, uh, and I was looking for them too. I mean, I was looking for official whistleblowers, but I know that if a NASA whistleblower comes out, uh, there's nothing I can do because there's no nobody can protect them. Uh, same thing with the United States Air Force because a lot of the NASA people come from the United States Air Force. But on top of the military people from the Navy and the Army and the Marine Corps uh, that I had coming out, I had a... Uh, career surveyor. Now, there, I also had a, a, I know Patricia had a, a structural engineer and, and I, there was other engineers that came out, but the surveyor was very, very interesting to me because what they did, this isn't a surveyor that just 
shoots houses, you know, sh you know, maps out your house for a foundation. This guy was doing big tracts of land, 20 plus miles, uh, car factories, big assembly lines, airport runways. Can you, can you break it down in sort of actual miles for people watching? Oh, okay. So if you're doing like a like an assembly line for like Toyota, he did one. I'm, I'm pretty sure for Toyota. Um, you know, assembly lines are very very long buildings. You know, series of buildings because the car is lives what it's it hasn't changed much since the Henry Ford idea. And that is, you know, the car starts here as this big chunk of metal, and it gets all its stuff added on, added on, added on. But it goes down 20 miles at least, and. So the building itself that they're building to house the production line is 20 miles long. Well, the, the complex is 20 miles. I mean, I don't sure, think it's sure. The level ground that they've got to actually yeah, get level, level so the buildings on is 20 miles. Yeah, they're shooting big, big tracts of land. And what he was saying was, what he he thought was very, very interesting, again, uh, why the pilots missed it, uh, but why he missed it was he's going, when you're shooting tracts of land, the surveyor's job is to make sure, you know, you're mapping out exactly the elevation and, and, and how the land lays out. And he goes, when you're taught to be a surveyor, they tell you the same thing up front. They go, the first basic rule is you treat your project, whatever you're, whatever you're setting up for, be it Toyota or an airport, you treat it like the world is perfectly flat. Now, when they tell them that, they're not actually saying that the world is perfectly flat. They're just saying, no, no, just treat all your projects like they're perfectly flat. The problem with that is that eventually you're going to have to deal with the curve because of my project, which is, let's say, a 10-mile square, and your project, which is another 10-mile square, eventually our projects are going to butt up against each other. Let, imagine, imagine a city. Well, that was a great example. And that is from one end of a city to another. There's a whole bunch of projects between one end and the other. He goes, you can't tell me that over those 20 miles, or whatever it is, however long the city is, that you're not having to deal with curvature eventually because it's eight inches per mile squared. So eventually somebody's going to have to deal with curvature. And even he, so he goes, he, he did it for 32 years and he retired uh, not that long ago. And he goes, he goes, not only did the curvature never come into question, but what they was never even accidentally brought up in, in conversation, which meant that like, let's say you were working with a guy on another project. Well, all these projects have to butt up against each other. Yeah, and it never, so, never causes a problem. Yeah. Uh Oh, Am I still on? Yeah, you're still on. No, I said that the, the curvature never causes a problem. Okay, sorry. I was getting a weird thing, like my camera was coming out for a second. All right, as long as we're cool, we're cool. All right. Yeah, we're so, cool. We, we, we're talking curvature and flat earth. Okay, so. we're talking flat earth. So the, the, the analogy is this, and that is, I don't know what the equivalent over in Britain is, but we have crackers over here, these little perfectly flat square crackers called wheat thins. And, he, and my analogy is, imagine if you try to cover a basketball or a round, you know, round surface with these square objects. You could do it, but there's going to be gaps. The only way you can cover a curved surface is with curved objects because that's, you know, because that's how you, you have to lay it out. It's got to be contoured. You can't lay it out. You can't cover a curved surface with perfectly square objects all the time because eventually they're going to be gaps and there weren't any gaps. And he goes, he goes, even by accident, let's say you were doing your project and I was doing my project and we butt up against each other. One of us forgets to account for curvature. Oh, hey, and that would be the accusation. It's like, oh, you forgot to account for curvature. No, you were afraid. Oh, I get it. He goes, that conversation never, ever happened. He goes, it, it was just a theory. It was just something they brought up. Uh, you know, when, when you first start out as a surveyor, they tell you about it. In fact, he was told many, many times when he was younger, you know, when he was in his 20s, when he asked, he goes, he goes, what about, he goes, he goes, what about the curvature? And they all said the same thing. It said, don't worry about it, which, and they okay, meant that yeah. literally because you never had to take into account. And uh, I thought that was fascinating because for, yeah, from a surveyor standpoint, they treat the world like it's perfectly flat, literally. And uh, you, you can't do it if, if the world has got a curve to it. Yeah, I mean, I like the the Lego bricks example. It's like you know, it's always going to be working on flat, but if you get a, a ball of Lego, y your bricks ain't going to work properly. There you go. Yeah, yeah, Lego's a great example uh, because yeah, there's no there's no such thing as a a curved surface in the in the Lego world. You can't you can't pull it off. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what he was saying. And uh, we we see that time and time again with everybody that I've that I've talked to. They've all said the same thing. And I know you'll probably ask me about other guys. But to summarize kind of what, what they all been saying, and that is, yeah, we've all heard of the curvature. We don't use it in our daily jobs. It's just something we hear about. It's, it's kind of like it's assumed, but it's re in reality, it's a myth. It's just never, ever used. They all said the same thing. It's like, it's, it's not, it, they don't even really mention it in the manual. 
it's it's just something that's kind of passed down from from generation to generation. It's oh yeah yeah the curvature thing. Are you going to use it in your thing today? No, I'm not going to use it today, or ever. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. I spoke to Jaron a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. Jaron had done several experiments using lasers to actually prove out flat Earth. Yeah. And I was quick to point out. I don't know if I'm allowed to call him this. Is it Sean? Your oh, Navy yeah, guy. Yeah. We, well, you mean the the military guy? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, Sean McCrary. Yeah, no, he's out. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Sean had basically scaled up, if you like, what Jaron had done across. I think it was five mile stretch of water with his laser. Yeah. Um, well, Sean's doing it in a much better way, if you like. Can you talk us through what Sean told you on? Yeah, right yeah. Uh, Sean McCrary. We initially introduced him as Robert uh, because he we we gave him every chance to be anonymous, but sure, sure. He, he's smart because. It's, he's very clever because if you know, you know, if you're a military guy, he's in the United States Navy for ten years. He wants to go career, but you know, you can get thrown out of the military for uh, on a Section Eight, which is basically that you're insane, right? But it, that that was a joke from some of our um, uh, things that our television shows over here. But so, but it's a great story. But let's because let's say the military wants to come at him and say, uh, oh yeah, you know, we're going to throw at you because you you think the Earth is flat. Well, what a great news story that would be. Because every psychological profile would say that he was sane, but he's saying, no, no, from a practical standpoint, I think it's flat. But basically what he came out and said was, because uh, he was a Sparrow missile system instructor, and he was he had access to technology that most people don't have, including two-inch beam radars. Because the Sparrow missile system, you have to paint the target literally. So if you're on your ship and you're trying to hit a ship that's 60 miles away, you have to paint it. You have to literally hit it with a straight beam a uh, two inch beam and then the missile has to kind of pick up the frequency that the beam is is reflecting off the ship and it hits it it's not like you're shooting the beam up and bouncing down no it's a straight point to point shot it goes 60 miles he goes that's thousands of feet worth of curvature he goes there's there's no way if the earth is curved that we should be able to paint that target and you can talk about refraction all you want and illusion it's like no no he goes we're not painting illusions we're hitting targets at 60 miles. And he goes, that's just the, the numbers I'm going to tell you. They're farther than that, but the rest is classified. He goes, he goes, there is no way that a two-inch beam radar can hit a target at 60 miles consistently. If, in fact, if it, if it wasn't consistent, you wouldn't even use the system. Uh, not only that, but he said the firing solutions, uh, you know, because they're, you know, we're not talking about snipers that are shooting a meager one mile. Uh, on a good day, we're talking about 60 miles with a missile. He goes, the firing solutions aren't taking into account the Coriolis effect, which is the spinning of the Earth. That isn't taken into account either. And then uh, for the for the icing on the cake for him, he comes out and he says, oh yeah, by the way, because the maps in the Southern Hemisphere appear to be completely wrong. He goes, for whatever reason, he goes, destinations do not make sense. They the the time allotted for us to to go to certain places are never right. Uh, and, and he goes, you know, we're talking about precision stuff nowadays. And he goes, in the GPS system, he goes, we don't even use it. That's a defense system, uh, you know, and we're not using it. They said, we're not using it as our primary navigation. It's still charts and pointing things. And when you're, when you're mapping the stuff, and then he goes, they're always straight lines. Always, yeah, always, always. A, to a triple, triple proof guy, wasn't he? he was oh, like, yeah, he was, he was great. I love the fact that he came out. And he even came out and vetted himself. So he comes out and he and he takes his own video of him flying yeah, in a helicopter uh, on a helicopter. Yeah, the helicopter landing on the Iwo Jima, which is where he was stationed. And then I didn't even ask him to do this. He he takes the picture from inside. I thought he was going to get in trouble for a second there. From inside the Sparrow System missile training room, and uh, where he actually writes down on a cocktail napkin and wax marker. Uh, flat Earth, and then writes my name just to make sure that you know that people know where where he is, who, who he's talking to. He flips the napkin over, turns it on himself, and it, it's like you you couldn't ask. And people are still saying, no, no, it's not real. It's like, what what more do you want? From I mean, this guy? the guy is definitely legit, but oh, absolutely, it's such a high standard of proof. Can we go through them in a bit more detail, one at a time? So sure. if if I'm explaining it wrong, just correct me. No, no, go ahead. Um, go ahead. But yeah, so you've got the radar scans around it to find targets and when it yep. finds a target and we'll say this target's 60 nautical miles on the horizon it yep. then has something called narrow radar which is about yep. two inch wide and it is yep. direct line of sight in other yep. words it has to actually make contact with the item it's looking at 
yep. in order to guide in a missile. So it has to literally paint the target, meaning put something on that target. Is that correct? That is, yeah, that's perfect. Exactly, that's exactly how it works. Um, and it, I think it would be, I don't know if it was nautical miles. Nautical miles is slightly longer than regular miles. I think it was, I think it was 60 land miles, but it doesn't really matter because either way, it's thousands of feet below the curvature. So to what you're saying, that boat, not only should you not be able to hit it, you shouldn't even be able to see it because it should be on the other side of the curvature. So unless you're telling me that that beam radar is following the curvature of the earth, and it, it which well, which it, well, it can't because that's not how it works. So it, no, you know. no. Plus, plus on top of that, it's like okay, you're following the curvature of the earth, but how are you aiming it? Because if you can't see the ship, how exactly are you throwing that beam down there in the first place? You're just going to just throw it down there, and then what's with the reflection off of it? You can't get the reflection from the ship, so you're just firing the missile up there and then hoping that the missile picks up on it. No, that's not well, how. There's it works. essentially nothing that can debunk it, and the technology behind what's happening is solid and proven yeah. and <laughs> you know yeah. works yeah absolutely absolutely so, i mean the second thing was the coriolis effect which i know uh, for any diehard flat earthers is 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 fairly easy to understand once you've wrapped your head around it but for anybody who may be tuning into this that has no idea even what the coriolis effect is can you explain what the sure. coriolis effect yeah. is and how sean essentially debunked it with the technology they use daily there's three different layers of the Coriolis effect. The two I'll do really shortly. Um, uh, one is uh, the flowing of water, either clockwise or counterclockwise, which if you want to look at a very, very interesting uh, stuff, I think it's uh, what learning something every day. I can't remember that guy. He's a really popular YouTube guy uh, where he set up him and his friend to do pools of water. And, and it was so subtle that the toilet's flushing. He goes, absolutely, it is not is not true. He goes, and he's not a flat earther. He they set up these kitty yeah, smarter every day. The what? Smarter every day. Did you watch this one? The one you know, I'm talking about where they yeah, set up I the kitty pools. <laughs> okay. The the kitty pools was brilliant because they had to use eyedroppers of of ink and then and they said only then, only then could you detect any subtle change as far as the Coriolis effect went, as far as it goes with water. Uh, the second part would be stars in the sky. And that is, uh, do stars in the sky spin differently? One, you know, one goes clockwise, the other goes counterclockwise. Um, and then the third part has to do with ballistics. And the ballistics thing is the really one that I've been focusing on because it's physical. It has to do with things that are down on the ground. And I have yet to find, and I have talked to, we'll, we'll end with Sean on, on this, but I have talked to, let's see, uh, a Marine, United States Marine Corps sniper instructor for three years said that the Coriolis effect is not used in the manuals which is interesting because mainstream media will tell you that it is. Uh, two different artillery guys, one in Fallujah, one in Afghanistan. Uh, one is actually a radar operator for the artillery section in uh, um, Afghanistan. And they both said that yeah, they're shooting out at 30 miles and that they're not accounting for Coriolis effect at all, which makes sense because if you're not doing it at one mile, you're certainly not doing it at 30 miles. Uh, the torpedo guy from the submarine, he's shooting at torpedoes at 25 miles. And even though it's underwater, you still have to take into account for it. Granted, it's a lot slower. That's not there. And then Sean, who's shooting missiles at the Sparrow Missile System at least 60 miles. And he's saying, look, the firing solution, which means firing the, the missile up there, he goes, you do not take into account the curvature of the Earth. And that makes so much sense because in order to even figure out the curvature of the Earth, you'd have to take a compass reading. Because the, the Coriolis effect, if the Earth was spinning, and if you're firing a projectile, you would have to figure out where you were facing. Not just, you know, you're, you're, so you're facing, you know, the target, but it's okay, are we north, are we south, are we east, are we west? And, and you know, what, what variation are we? And what part of the globe are you on? Because remember, if, if you're on a globe and the Earth's spinning at the North Pole, you're not spinning at all. But at the equator, you're spinning the maximum amount. So you'd have to take all these things into account. Nobody's doing any of that. They're not. Well, I don't know. I'm sure I read a tweet from Neil deGrasse Tyson that said that um, some of the football players. Oh, did oh, oh. how dare you? How dare you bring that up? Okay, first of all, I follow football, and that's why I'm wearing my Seattle Seahawks hat. Go Hawks, because they're still in the playoffs, at least for this week. Uh, and that is, uh, yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson, desperate man. And don't think for a second that I don't know that you're running from me because you will not interview me. You were supposed to be on the freaking Art Bell show with me. Oh yeah, absolutely he did. Uh, he 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 turned us down. That's the reason why the um, uh, Stanton Friedman thing happened, because Neil deGrasse wouldn't do it. Uh, he he won't do it. And it was it was a, such an innocent letter. I read it, which was, would you be willing to go on the show and talk about the shape of the Earth with Mark Sargent? 
How much more Agreed. innocent? It's pretty agreeable. No, he's not going to. There's no way. So he goes on and he tweets the NFL, the National Football League here in America, when, uh, in fact, go figure, when the Seattle Seahawks lost to the Cincinnati Bengals, the Cincinnati Bengals kicked a field goal and it hit the upright and went in and they scored. And he tweets, the reason why it hit the upright and went in was because of the Coriolis, Coriolis effect. I can't begin to tell you how irritated I was because, well, one, because we lost the game, but two, because you're talking about an oblong football spinning, spinning end to end because of a kicker at 40 yards, 40 yards. The Coriolis effect is going to affect how that kick. Oh, it was just aggravating. Plus he was just uh, wasting his breath because he's a nerd. Why are you telling jocks, you know, nerd stuff, nerd science to the NFL football league? They're all meatheads. Oh, they're going to love the Coriolis effect. Oh yeah, they're I all in science. I, I, it's the talk. That's all. I, I talk see professional about. football players in their towels. They're just reading through physics all day long. Yeah, it was. Ridiculous. I mean, it's talk of the media. I mean, will the media ever back the fact that there is no curve? It's. I still believe that they are going to try to take control of this thing sooner or later because they, they because the the problem with their invention of social media. You know, social media was initially designed, and I loved the uh, the story that was run by the Onion television show, where the, it was like, you don't know how much money the, the CIA has saved because of Facebook. You know, you know, people will just post all their information. Intelligence gathering, can you imagine the Nazis? Yeah, and well, I'm just talking about that, saying about, you know, if, if you actually knew, or if someone boiled it down for you and said, there's this, eight, there's this page that will take all of your information, where you are, what you do with your friends. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah and you're you going to volunteer. Yeah, yeah, you're going to give it all up. I mean, honestly, but but the social media project has somewhat backfired on them, and that is it has become more prevalent than mainstream media, and that is television. Look, everyone knows that television is dying because there's there's so many channels, it's so fragmented, but more importantly than that, it's not fast enough compared to a lot of the interactive things that people want. YouTube is the new television, and, it, and it, it has been for some years now. And because of that, people are pumping out a lot of information, a lot of different places, So, uh, which is why the, the flat earth concept and really a lot of conspiracy concepts are gaining way more traction because how are you gonna, how are you gonna control that if you're the authority? You, you can't shut it down. Um, the best you can do is kind of kind of steer it in a certain directions, maybe hope for the best. Um, they've been avoiding it so far, um, but even Neil deGrasse Tyson, when he came on uh, Bloomberg Television and CNN just last month, and he goes, and he's telling them, and this is the part, again, that feels kind of like a setup, because I've been in this long enough that I'm kind of becoming jaded. You know, I don't take things at face value anymore. And that is, he goes on national television, and he tells the host that if you're going to give ball earthers a uh, voice, you should not give equal time to the flat earthers. And I'm thinking, why in the world are you saying this live? Why are you talking about this on television? Because you could just as easily have, have easily done this behind closed doors with the producers. You don't have to do this great news. The fact that he's even uttering the words. Exactly. Which means they, it feels like they're, they're, they're running out of gas. Well, I mean, let's face it. Let's what, look what's happened in the last 30 days. Um, after NASA received its $20 billion budget for 2016, they come out almost immediately and say that they're shutting down the Orion program, which was one of the, the cruxes that we use because the Orion program, again, you can look it up on NASA, their website, uh, Orion Trial by Fire, where they said that they, didn't ha they don't know how to figure out the Van Allen radiation problem. And then they come out and say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're, we're postponing the program indefinitely. What are you talking about indefinitely? Well, because of a French piece of uh, scientific hardware, the French didn't have ready in time, so we're going to miss our window. So uh, we're going to scrub all the launch dates to at least 2018. That, that was staggeringly amazing. And then uh, the Canadian... You touched on it. I want, I want to kind of keep you on track because of a question I was going to ask sure, a bit sure. later. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, I, and I'll phrase it really directly because mm -hmm. you've brought up the, the Van Allen problem, but which we'll hopefully cover in this, this next question. But yeah. have we been to the moon... <laughs> God, no. No, no, no. In fact, this, I love, I love Flat Earth so much because it answered a question for me that I have been looking for for the last 10 years, which was, it's not that we faked the moon stuff. The moon stuff is, has aged horribly. I mean, it hasn't aged as badly as some of the 60 television shows. Like, um, oh, it's, it's not terrible, but it's obvious. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not as bad as like Gilligan's Island or Bewitched or, or stuff like that. So, some some television shows from back then, but it's aged badly. So what what I was looking at when I looked at the moon was okay. It's not that it was faked. Why are you faking it? And that's was it was someone's like why why do it? Why not why not why why would you spend that sort of? I mean, you want to do it for American pride and say oh we planted the flag rah rah go USA. Yeah, it's, that's okay, but man, you spent a lot of money for something. The, the return on investment just wasn't there. Then when the flat earth thing came into effect, then it made sense because it 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 fell, it fell it took a big piece and it put it in the middle of a lot of other puzzle pieces, which was it's not – it turned it from a question into a statement, which was it's not that you wanted to fake the moon program. You had to fake it. If you do not fake the Apollo program, you run the risk of private corporations eventually getting involved, the public getting behind it, and enough enthusiasm getting behind private space programs to where, especially corporations, that that you can't stop it. So you have to become the gatekeepers right away. You create the Apollo program, you fake it as long as you can, you make it as boring as you can, and then you shut the whole thing down and keep it under wraps for as long as you can, because it, it, admit it. I mean, all the military subcontractors that are out there that would have, who could have pulled this off, uh, McDonnell Douglas, General Dynamics, Boeing, uh, Hughes Aircraft to a lesser degree, you know, all these systems, they would have partnered with some of the bigger corporations, the oil companies or, or heck even now, I mean, Coca-Cola, they'd love to be on the moon. Pepsi, Frito-Lay, are you kidding? Corporate banners would love to be on the moon and they're not. Uh, so you have to fake the moon program. No different than you have to fake the space program to get the picture. You have to fake the moon program to at least get it out of people's heads. Uh, and even one of a uh, couple of physicists that were hanging out in uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's show the other day, uh, a younger girl, she's going, she goes, yeah, she goes, that's a thing. And like, she goes, yeah, that's great. She goes, do it again. She goes, she goes, I want to be alive when there's somebody landing on the moon, walking around. She goes, I yeah. want that. Let's do it again. Because we're two generations out now to where you can talk to somebody that's coming out of college right now. And they're like, I mean, the moon is ancient history by comparison. And, and the question has to come up, especially with the younger generation. It's like, why aren't we there right now? And they're saying, well, there's people. It's like most people don't know. For example, there's supposedly a Chinese space probe that's been there since 2013. That's been yeah. kind of driving around doing stuff. It's like, why aren't you in the sea of tranquility? Take a pictures of the moon buggies and the American flag and accidentally tipping it over and saying, oops, didn't mean to do that. Nobody's doing that. Um, no country, no country. So there's all these space organizations, right? The Indian, uh, the Chinese, the Russian, uh, the Japanese, the European Union, all these pe people supposedly have space programs and nobody's even talking about landing somebody on the moon. Why not? It's been 19, we left, supposedly last left in 1972. It's 43 years. Nobody's doing anything on the moon. Don't give me that crap. It's, it's, They've avoided it so deliberately that only now, uh, again, with, with the internet and social media, only now are people kind of taking notice and starting to scratch their head, which is why I put the questions out there. Uh, people have been giving me, you know, some of the debunkers saying, well, you know, you don't have proof. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. The burden of proof has, has been on mainstream science now for 500 years. And all the proof that they should have, and by that I mean tens of thousands of pictures of the earth in full view and sunlight and thousands of hours of video of the earth rotating on its axis. I, oh God. Well, you've, you've kind of, you've touched on something that's quite interesting in the respect that we have got photos now and yes, we'll accept that or we've got a photo and lots of composites, yeah. but we knew what earth was long before we could even fly. You know, we knew exactly what everything was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we did. And that was that was the funny thing about this theory. Now, part of it, I do believe, was whoever built this place, that was part of the natural process. And that is hide the fence by allowing the globe model to, to, to come into being. But there were huge assumptions that were made for an amazing amount of years, for hundreds of years. And that was, you didn't, you were talking about the Earth as a globe, but you didn't have anywhere near the technology to prove it. All you had was the math. And yeah, so... No just, just Again, old. the first balloons. So if you, you, you talk about the, the globe Earth in the 1500s, it takes 250 years before you even get balloons that can carry people. 
Um, it takes all the way until 1900 before your very first planes happen. And then really, and it's not that long ago, all the way up until 1957 before you can send a rocket up high enough to maybe take a picture of the Earth from space. And you would have thought people would have been clamoring for that. And they dragged their feet for years on that one. Because think about this. If you believe the Apollo space program, Apollo 8 went around, supposedly orbited the moon. They didn't land. Uh, nine supposedly didn't. I uh, thank you for the guy that emailed me finally and, and, and checked the, the homework on that. Apollo 9 didn't, but Apollo 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. All those flights supposedly went to the moon and back. Nobody took a picture. The only picture that was taken was the last mission. Apollo 17, on the way back, Oh, yeah, by the way, we better take a shot of the moon. They, I mean, that just screams uh, uh, dragging your feet. And that is, we're going to wait till the last possible minute before we release a picture of Earth. It's like, really, 1969, you're not going to do that? You're, you're not going to take pictures of the Earth constantly? Uh, they, they waited, and then they only took one on top of it. One shot of full-blown, you know, Earth from space uh, in direct sunlight. Uh, and, and, and then they milked it for 43 years. I, that is amazing uh, marketing ability there. Uh, but again, the internet sunk it in the end because they, they couldn't hold it forever. But they did, I will give them this, they held on to it for as long as they could, a lot longer than I thought they would be able to pull it off. I mean, you're, you're, you're saying that obviously the, the lie surrounding the moon has crumbled. But as the life of flat Earth slowly starts to crumble away beneath us, one of the things that you postulate in your flat Earth clues is that people will run to the church. And again, back to Jaron, who was on a couple of weeks ago, he kind of, the way he put it was that the church has got you in the heliocentric model, whether you become an atheist or become a priest, it makes no odds the church has bought into the heliocentric model. And for that reason, people wouldn't uh, run back. Would you, would you still stand by the, the sort of good China explanation or the good silverware that they'll pull it out and say we knew yeah. all along? Here, yeah, I do. And here's why. Um, the, the church, because people are... Oh. I don't want to. I don't want to step on too many toes here, but uh, I'm going to try. So I'll be. I'll be delicate. And that is, look, 80% of the population of this world follows a religion in some way, shape, or form. And the the five big ones that are out there: Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. They're big. They're all big. They're all powerful. And there's a lot of loyal people involved. Uh, and I, in fact, I don't even know who's who's the most enthusiastic of any of those groups. Uh, the probably the least enthusiastic would probably be Buddhism because they just do their own thing. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that you're giving them, they've all been looking for the longest time, everybody's been looking for some sort of uh, magical uh, artifact. You know, they've all been looking for something that they can stick on, you know, put under a pedestal, I'm sorry, put on a pedestal and say, this is proof that religion is real and God is real. So Ark of the Covenant, Holy Grail. The Ark of, yeah, the Holy Grail, uh, Spirit Destiny, uh, you know, the, the the One Ring. You know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> Don't they, I go off on, the, on that stuff. But yeah, it's all it's all basically the same thing. If if this if we are created and again it's going to be tough to be an atheist if if this you know actually comes to fruition and I think it's going to fairly soon then the, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to look to the church for help for two reasons one they're going to look at science unfortunately science is going to take a huge hit in the stomach and that is they're going to say at the very least oh by the way science was wrong about oh something kind of small uh, the shape of the earth. It's not like they were wrong. It's not like being wrong about this or that. When you're wrong about something about the shape of the earth, that's going to that's gonna tick a lot of people off. And there's going to be, yeah, they may, they may not be uh, go on television and say it, but there's going to be a lot of pulpit speeches saying that science was wrong and we knew it the whole time. You know, we always said there was a firmament and this and that. And honestly, even if... I wasn't kidding when I said this. Even if you parked a giant alien spaceship next to the edge of the firmament and you had them out there and they, they had blueprints, they said, we built it. You're still going to have a huge amount of people that aren't going to buy it. They're going to say, you know what? You didn't build crap. God built it. And you're not the highest power. And which again, which is why the one, the big reason why you hide this thing for as long as you can, because you can't be the ultimate authority on this world if you're not the ultimate authority. Uh, you can be the strongest government in the world with the strongest military, but if you're inside an enclosed structure, if you're in a built world, 
people are going to look and say, yeah, you're strong and all that, but who built this place exactly? Because I'm guessing they're stronger than you are. Uh, and it gets, it gets weird from there. So do I think people will still run to the church? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, do. Do you take any of the, the religious texts as proof of some of the theoretical information out there, like the waters above? Uh, is that, or is that separating the waters below? Silver? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, the, um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of similarities, and some people aren't going to want to hear this, but there are a lot of big similarities between uh, Christianity and Judaism and Islam. You know, they share quite a few of the same stories, and, and people know that Buddhism, Hinduism, they got their own thing going. But uh, yeah, when it comes to the text, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw some of it back to you know, because I'm not going to, I'm not a big on quoting chapter and verse, but I will mention two things. One is Rob Skiba, of course. Uh, real big on chapter and verse, and he went over everything, at least in the King James, uh, with a fine-toothed comb. And he said, yeah, yeah, there's some things that talk about, you know, that you could you could interpret as a sphere, but there's a lot more things that talk about the earth not moving, the earth being fixed, uh, and, of course, all the stories that, and I only touched on uh, one in the clues, but the story of Joshua, where he asks that the, the Lord hold the sun in the sky an extra day so he can slay more of it, more enemies. Well, that's tough to do in a solar system. There's a lot of physics you got to mess with. But if it's just an enclosed system, that's just hitting the pause button. That's easy by comparison. Not to mention the, the, the Tower of Babel, which doesn't make any sense on a spinning globe that's going through the solar system. But if it's a fixed thing and you're trying to get to the firmament, that tower makes um, a lot more sense. So what are, your, what are your actual religious beliefs? I mean, I asked because in yesterday's Strange World broadcast, you were talking about your survival guide that you did a few years back and said about yeah. getting good karma by giving it away for free. I mean, do you believe in God? Do you believe in the devil? Oh, abso absolutely, I do. Um, I was raised... Okay, there's a couple things. One is... I was raised born again Christian, you know, vacation Bible school and youth group and Sunday service. And, and so, so I did all the fun stuff. But when I went, got to college, it went off and doing my own thing. I kind of fell away from that. Flat Earth, though, reaffirmed what I always believed. And that is, I do believe in what goes around, comes around, you reap what you sow. And uh, the karma is very, very real. Uh, if, if people want to call it a different name, that's that's one thing. But I will not, and I, that's why I made a clue on it. Uh, I will not do anything malicious to anyone ever again. Not while I'm on this world. Because I do, you know, because if you're, if, if we are created and this place was created, then you are accountable. Now, I'm not saying that you're, you're constantly being, you know, got a camera on you 24 seven, but are you going to take that chance? You know, the, the, the joke I, I made and, and some people think I was being glib about it, which was, uh, you know, the Santa Claus argument. And that is, and everyone knows about the naughty and nice list, but how many people actually pay attention to it? Well, you do if you actually see Santa Claus sitting in your living room. Then you really start thinking about, it's like, are you really going to start doing naughty stuff? Or are you going to finally come around and, and do what you're supposed to be doing? And that is be nice to people. Uh, are, you, are you suggesting that Santa Claus is allegory for the devil? <laughs> what well, the acronym fits and that is yeah santa is an acronym for satan yeah. that, that's a that's a tough one uh i don't i don't know i it's it's i i, I haven't really given it much thought for thanks thanks for that one <laughs> well i slipped it in like it was your idea <laughs> <laughs> no 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 although it it's yeah the santa argument is interesting that's for sure. You know, he 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 looks kind of he kind of looks like the 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 personification of God, but he wears red, uh, and yeah, again, his 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 uh, name is an anagram for somebody else that's uh, completely different. So I think, I think I'll change the subject. Um, that's all right. One, one of the other things you mentioned in your clues was um, 1984, and this was a, a question that I I phoned my father about and sort of talked about it a little bit with him and it turned into an hour long conversation about this one question. And it was a loose question like most of them that I just sort of slapped down. And it's even really leading, but I'm gonna I'll ask it just as it's written, which was that, like I say, you mentioned uh, 1984. Are there any flat earth clues in 1984? No, no, I only mentioned it because uh, 1984, what a weird book and a weird, even a stranger movie. It just seems to, every year, it seems to get more and more relevant. And we've been saying this now for decades, but it just seems to be getting more and more relevant to where even changing history, you know, changing, uh, you know, having the news media, the, the fact that the news media is completely scripted, even at the local levels, and, uh, and that, you know, we're, 
the, the, the old line from the matrix is we're not here because we're free. We're here because we're not free. You know, that, that whole thing. So I don't think there's any flat earth references necessarily, but relevance to our current civilization. Oh yeah. Yeah. You want to watch it. Is. I thought you'd go straight to it. There's a, there's a bit where he's in the interrogation room and the interrogator is, ba interrogator is basically explaining that the stars could be close or could be far away. They can oh, make I, do, I didn't know, nobody told me that one. That's great. That's excellent. I hadn't I hadn't heard that. I get new refer movie references. Again, the I've I've been quick to say that the internet hive mind misses nothing. Like the um the Sword in the Stone, that Disney movie from uh, 1963. Somebody mentioned that to me that there was a scene in there where they actually pulled out a flat Earth map, uh, and that you know he was talking to the kid about how the Earth is going to be discovered to be round, like the wizard was telling him what's going to happen in the future. And I included that uh, in the uh, in the Strange World. Uh, which I have to re-upload after the show is over, but unfortunately, because the uh, uh, the copyright I didn't get struck or anything. But yeah, the it still copyright, works on DC. Oh no, no, no! It wasn't that. It was I got I, I they finally took it down. Oh, did they actually take it down? Yeah, they did because I I put in a Twilight Zone uh, three minutes of a Twilight Zone episode where they were talking about mob mentality and how people lash out at other people, and it does not take much for us. Because I do think, I do think we're... A, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mark. There's, a, there's another word for that, which is gaslighting, which is what they're essentially doing. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah I've heard several people have mentioned gaslighting to me recently. Uh, but yeah, where the mob mentality, it doesn't take much, and I think that is one of the, the big flaws of our civilization, and that is if we have a common goal, I think we can do amazing, amazing things. But if we don't, all that energy and passion and enthusiasm, we have a real tendency to uh, turn against each other, uh, which is which is sad. I mean, I'm kind of ticking off the flat earth clues here, but one of the okay. things that uh, has come under a little bit of, well, someone just disagreed, I might as well just mention my name. So Math Powerland fundamentally disagreed with your principle when it came to discussing flat earth, which is yeah. the first rule of flat club don't talk about flat club. Yeah. Um, would you still say that that is the best rule of thumb in general? Turns. I've seen well, yeah, because you you've got to know the movie reference first, and that is 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 the, the 1999 movie. 1990, by the way, the the greatest year in movies. Anyone have any doubt? Look up the films that came out in 1999. But Fight Club with Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, where the first rule of Flat Club, the Fight Club, is you don't talk about Fight Club, but it's just something you say. So you're not supposed to talk about Fight Club with everybody. You're supposed to discern who exactly you think is up for it. You can't just go into any room and say, hey, let me talk about this Fight Club I'm involved with on Thursday nights. You go in and you see who might be a good candidate to be in Fight Club. So when it comes to the Flat Earth thing, I've just seen, I've gotten too many emails from people that go to their family dinner table uh, especially over the holidays. I mean, my God. Or they'll sit at Thanksgiving and they'll say, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> I'm into flat earth now. And it's like, are you kidding? You would have been better off to say that uh, you've changed your religion, you've changed your sexuality, uh, and you're going to start taking, you know, uh, skin pigmentation and change your ethnic. Right? Recovering alcoholic transsexual. But exactly. Flat yeah. earther. No exactly. Way. Yeah, I'm. I'm a. Um, I'm. I'm now going to be a uh, uh, a gay Buddhist heroin addict. You might as well say something like that, because, and not I'm not picking up Buddhism, but I'm just saying the big change because people will look at you like you got a bug on your face. You you can't. I know people are excited about that. I mean, it, but the, the 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 one of the drawbacks of flat Earth is once you get through the process, the five stages of acceptance, uh, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Once you get through those, you forget how much time it took you to get to flat earth. And so when you want to bring it to somebody, it's like, I'm excited. I got through flat earth in two weeks. I think I can convince you in an hour. You are kidding yourself. You couldn't well, be convinced. No, I was really naive because I pretty much got it as soon as all right. Well, all right. You're one of the rare people. I, I'm an exception. I know that now. But yeah. at the time, I was really naive. I thought everyone will get this straight away, just like I have. Yeah. And boy, was I wrong. Yeah, exactly. Most people, it takes them a while. And that's because people are excited once they become flat earthers. They're excited and they want to tell people about it. And, and that's why I do the, the, the fight club thing. It's like, look, you've got to remember how long it took you. And then at the very least, maybe you can cut that time in half if you think you can tell them very well. But unless you can explain it really, really well, uh, you're better off just showing people some videos and putting well, them. Well, you did have three, three very good solutions. I mean, the first one, I mean, if you want to 
they're yours, so I won't take the words out of your mouth. But the first was you're being hidden. Hmm. I mean, do you, want, do you want to explain exactly what you mean by, you know, you said it right at the end of the clues to sort of get people's interest and, and tackle it without using the words flat earth. But yeah. when you say you are being hidden, what, 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 how, how is that relevant to somebody bringing up flat earth to somebody else who isn't a flat earther? <laughs> The, the you're being hidden thing is really more of a well, the, you know, money's being hidden, you're being hidden, uh, the the God God is being hidden. That's those are the three big ones, and uh, but yeah, there's different because yes, that's one of the first things I tell people. I say, look, bring up flat Earth without using the term flat Earth, and I'm gonna I'll, I'll call Alex Jones show out now because I know that their producers wanted to do a show on flat Earth, but the point was they couldn't figure out how to do a show without mentioning the words flat Earth. That was their problem. And because once the, the, they were worried about if their audience figured it out, would they turn off? You know, would they just lose droves of people? And that's the same with anybody's show uh, that, that, that is nervous about doing it. They, they all say the same thing. And that is, we don't know how to bring up flat earth. We're nervous about bringing it up because, yeah, there's a whole bunch of people that are in it. But there's a whole bunch of people that aren't in it. Are we willing to swap those people? And um, But, yeah, you're being hidden. Okay, first off, fl instead of flat earth, which is why I deliberately used enclosedworld.com. I could have used flatearth.com or a variation of it. I chose enclosed world or enclosed earth or enclosed system or Truman show, anything those, along those lines. I love Truman show as a reference. Uh, yeah, it's become a cliche now in the flat earth world, but it's so true. It's so unbelievably true. And that is what's the difference between the Truman show and where we are now. It's just bigger. That's all it is. The, the premise still applies. That, and there's probably not really many actors in our version because you don't need them. Uh, well, that's why when I was, in fact, I was really excited when I made that clue because I realized as you were scaling it up, it was like, holy smokes, you don't even need the actors once you get to a certain size. And two generations later, if there were any actors, you just pull them all out and that's it or let them die natural causes. And, and that, would, that would be it. Um, for us, 10 generations later, here we are on a globe spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. Exactly. And nobody, and nobody questions it. No different than, which is why I used, and I don't want to forget that you the being hidden part, but why I used the movie, uh, the M night Shyamalan movie, the village, because that was done without any special effects whatsoever. And that was, we believe what we are told as kids. So if you take kids out into a wildlife preserve and you build a fake town from the 1800s and tell them, Oh yeah, by the way, you live in the 1800s. Why wouldn't they believe it? What, why, what, they're going to believe exactly what you tell them. No, they, they, they actually live a hundred years later in the future, but they don't know that. So what's the difference between what we know that again, why it's, why this trick is so good because people don't like to be fooled. People don't like to be, you know, you know, they, they like street magic, but they want to know, they don't like to be fooled by it if they can help it. And I, I try to tell them, I was going, look, don't be so hard on yourself. You were fooled the day you were born. You were, you were, and your parents were fooled, and they were fooled generations before you. You didn't have a chance. <laughs> your parents told you you lived in a globe. What, what did you think you were going to do? You were going to believe that. Um, anyway, sorry, get back to the, the hidden things. So you were being hidden. That was a direct reference to the GPS system, which was trying to get people to say, look, if you're flying in the southern hemisphere uh, over water, below the, uh, anywhere below the equator, your plane's not being tracked. And that's a big deal especially for Americans, because we're arrogant and we have all a huge sense of self-importance. We don't, you know, we don't like to think that we're being lost in any way, shape or form. Um, money is being hidden. And that is the corporations, uh, the corporations in the uh, Antarctica uh, that aren't allowed to go there. Why, why isn't anyone allowed to make money down in Antarctica? And then of course, God being hidden. Uh, that's, that's the big one that I tried to, you know, get towards the people in the church. And that is if you, everybody in the church wants to know there's proof of God. What if there was proof of God, proof of intelligent design? If the government found it, would it be any different than, than all the other secrets they've been hiding for years and years? Like an Indiana Jones movie. If they found proof of God, would they tell you? They probably would think about it for a few minutes, but that's all they would think about it and say, yeah, we're not showing them proof of God because that changes the power structure and it takes a long time to recoup from that. And they're just not going to do it. Uh, they're going to hold on to it, and they've been holding on to it for 60 years. And they're they're going to hold on to the bitter end or until they can flip it on you, until they can use it to their advantage, which is why I'm you know still doing research every day trying to figure out what's next. And maybe maybe got one question or maybe a little quick fire round. Now, sure. 
as, as a, I don't know, you're probably the most vocal of any flat earthers. And as a result of that, I was a little bit overwhelmed with the reaction I got on just a little advert I put out for this show. And people had a lot of questions. Sure. And frankly, I was a little bit ticked off that they were all kind of, well, they were all personal questions about you. Not that I'm not interested in you personally, but we're not on a date. Um, so it's entirely up to you. I've either got one sort of final question or, if you want to, the trolley, shilly questions that I've been posed that I, if you want them, I'll ask them because apparently this is what people want to know. All right. You throw them at me. I, I've got to I, throw them at me. We got them. You sure? Couldn't hurt at this point. Fair enough. Okay, well, I'll, I'll rattle them off. There's not very many. So sure. first and foremost, Mr. Sergeant, what is your current job? Nothing. I am currently looking. I moved up to Seattle in uh, five months ago from Boulder, Colorado, where I was working for the last 20 years. And the flat earth thing, I really wanted to get into it. I think it's something that's going to be something major. And so I am up uh, north of Seattle right now living with family. And I am undecided whether or not it really depends on, on if something takes off or not. And l let me, I'll be perfectly blunt here. This thing got enough speed quickly enough that there were television people that were fishing around on this. And the stuff that they were talking about seemed to be pretty involved. And I was like, going, okay, do I really, what do I want to do here? Because if I go back into the, you know, get back into the tech thing, how long, you know, that's Murphy's law. If I get back to the tech thing and all of a sudden I get a call, look, I'm not going to turn down. If there, if a TV thing happens uh, and anyone out there wants to criticize me for that, don't be hypocritical because anybody in the flat earth will do the same thing. Uh, and well, there's other people. Leads me on nicely to the next question, which is, sure. pretty sure I know the answer to this. Are you being paid for interviews? No, God, no. As a matter of fact, I'll even take that one more, uh, one step further, and that is I have not even solicited a single, including this one, uh, I have not solicited a single interview. Everybody has contacted me. Uh, I, I emailed you. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody has contacted me, uh, including the repeat interviews. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not in, in close touch with anybody, and that includes uh, Ground Zero and Coast to Coast uh, and everybody else in between and the people that are, you know, even even the people that have kind of been circling around, like the John B. Wells thing that were waiting to happen, the Art Bell thing that never happened. Uh, the other shows were, were just, but no, I have not been paid a dime for the interviews. Why, why would I? You don't, you don't generally pay people for interviews unless you get to a certain level, uh, and that's usually mainstream. The conspiracy world, pfft. Oh, that is fast. Uh, I mean, this is pretty much the same question, but rephrased slightly. So have you sure. profited from Flat Earth? No, and I did that deliberately. There are certain things that I did uh, that I wanted to, to, I wanted to make myself as transparent as possible. So I put out my full name. Uh, you know, my channel is called Mark K. Sargent. K stands for Kendall. Uh, you know, my backstory is all there. You know, grew up in, near Seattle, moved out to Boulder, Colorado. Uh, you know, everything is real. You can all look it up. Uh, all the games I, I worked on, all the stuff. And yes, I did play games professionally. Um, and I didn't monetize my YouTube channel. I'm not selling a coffee mug or a t-shirt. If you guys think I'm making money anywhere, you show me where. You show me a single donation link. You show me a single anything. And that's done for credibility more than anything else. I do not want to be accused of, of being a sellout. That being said, if a television thing came to me and says, we want to do a reality show on Flat Earth, oh, you bet I'm doing it. Don't think. Uh, yeah, I, think maybe. I mean, I would, I would monetize my videos if there was any point. But Well, the, the monetizing of the videos, I just don't like the commercials. Uh, so, yeah, there's some, you'll see some ads on some of the stuff I do, but that's mostly because if I use a piece of music that's already been monetized, you know, it, it will come through automatically. But sure, the, Flat sure. Earth, the Flat Earth clues doesn't have a single one on them. And yeah, uh, I did that as a viewer, it's annoying when you've got to wait 20 seconds to skip the ad, which you inevitably do do. And, you know, exactly. not monetizing it just makes your videos more enjoyable to watch. Yeah, yeah. And and for those conspiracy people out there, um, I can't hypnotize you if you, I keep being interrupted with commercials. So. <laughs> uh, next, there's only a couple more questions from the viewers, which That's is okay. genuinely where these have come from. So how much time in a day would you say you spend on Flat Earth? Really varies. I mean, I'd say a minimum of four hours, maybe maybe five. But if I'm doing like a special project, like a like a music slideshow, like today I'll be spending quite a bit because I did an interview for this one. I've got to upload Strange World from last night, and so most of it's just 
technical crap. Plus, I got to look at the dailies. So I literally go in and I say, flat earth, set the filter to today, see what's new. And now, because of all the news stuff that's happening, I have to go into a, you know, a couple search engines and type in flat earth and see if, what's going on in there. Uh, so yeah, minimum, minimum four hours, maximum uh, eight on a, on a bad day. We'll see. And of, of all of them, there was literally one flat earth question, which I thought was good and reasonably well phrased, but I'll ask it here and I pretty much know what the answer is already, but, but um, can you address the curve that we still see after lens correction at 30 miles up? Show me where that is. Uh, he, he, well, I'll, okay, I'll address it with this because Jonathan, uh, my my old co-host from Strange World, actually came up with a better thing, and that was he said that he he was looking at some three D modeling, and some people have already done this. And you take a sphere and you take a, a fake camera on a three D model, you have to go up very very high to see any curvature at all, a lot further than thirty miles. And people say, well, doesn't that disprove the flat Earth? I'm going, no, no, no. What that does is it shows the weather balloons that actually have no curvature at all, but at the very least, when you compare it to the NASA stuff, why does the NASA stuff, even at lower, you know, medium altitudes, have this severe curvature, including the ISS time lapse for footage? That curvature is ridiculous for for what uh, for the altitude they say it's at. Those that that concludes our viewer question section. <laughs> I've got one final question, and it's about um, a particular person who I, I know you know a little bit about, but I've I've been looking into recently and finding to be a quite a fascinating character. Yeah. Uh, and I know you're a card carrying member of the Flat Earth Society. That's great, isn't it? Yeah, I actually, here, I'll show it to you right here. Yep, there it is. Flat Earth Society. That's the original Flat Earth Society where Thomas Dolby is a member. Uh, well, that was who I was going to ask you about. Thomas Dolby? Yeah. I mean, Seriously, that's, that's, that's what you're going to ask about? He's a, he's a card carrying member like yourself of the Flat Earth Society, and yeah. he's there dancing around, singing about science with Buzz Aldrin. Oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> he doesn't know, but but the, I don't know if if Thomas Dolby is actually a true believer or it, because you know this society, even though I'm a card carrying member number five thirty nine, the uh, I, I condemned them early on. I think in the very first introduction because. The, again, I've never seen a place where you have dedicated trolls that come in year after year and just chase people away like like bad bouncers at a club. It, I've just never seen anything like that. And so what that's what say? I mean, you said in the, the clues or one of the interviews was you phrased it. There's nothing to see here. But what would they actually no, say? literally that's it. Nothing to see here. The, the Flat Earth Society isn't serious. You don't have to join. You don't have to be a member. You might as well not even show up. It's like they're talking you out of going into the club and it's these guys should have been shut down years ago and they have thousands of posts that's their job that's all they do and there's like two main guys and all that's all they do day in it's like you know anyone that posts any interest in the flatter society at all they just shoo them away and i was really amazed that as this thing at you know as flat earth blew up in 2015 that the flatter society didn't approach me formally and just or approach anybody on a regular basis and say, hey, you know, why? In fact, why aren't they absolutely jumping on board with this? Thing? That's a good point. I'd never thought about it. You just because you know they're controlled opposition. You just yeah, you just yeah, accept that and you don't think about it. But yeah, that's really suspicious. Why aren't they? Battering why down aren't they? Because just just running with this thing. I mean, the 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 amount of increase in attention to this topic, you would have think that this 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 is their the the second coming for them. And they don't even, you know, they they say, oh, yeah, this video is good, this video is good, but that's it. They don't, they just don't get involved. And I'm just amazed. I'm just really, really amazed. Well, and then you know, Eric, not to not to give him too much credit, but he he was disgusted with him enough that he ended up founding his own flat Earth research society, just just to get away from him. And now I, I mean, I never go to their forums. I never do anything. I just, I, I'm just surprised that uh, that they never emailed anybody after that. So. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's a crazy situation. Was there anything that uh, you wanted to tell any viewers about, things that you've got up and coming, interviews um, and so forth? I'm trying to get a tank. Com oh, I've got a bunch of interviews coming up, uh, but nothing. Uh, I'm trying to get – the, there's there's, I did an interview recently with Fade to Black, and he's one of the, co the backup co-hosts for Coast to Coast, and I've I'm, I'm got to get that one up really soon. Um, trying to get a tank commander. Uh, we're trying to, because he's fairly high up there. 
in rank and uh that might be a little tough to do to, to get them to actually come on air but that's the united states military uh united states army oh cool more, more proofs on strange world <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm. I'm trying to get next. I'm still looking for Air Force. Still looking for ex NASA, uh, and still looking for an astrophysicist to to come out and and put their neck on the line. The closest I got was a German guy, uh, but he he wouldn't do it. He he'd only do it anonymously. And it's like, what, what's the point? Are you kidding? I have my full name and everything. You won't come out there and and put your neck on the line. And most of it's because they're worried. Uh, they don't want just in case something goes wrong. Now they're ninety nine percent sure that they can handle it. But if something goes wrong, do you really want your name attached? I mean, that's a lot of education that's uh, that, that's on the line there. So we'll see. But, you presume you don't want your family ridiculed as well. And Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So eh, we'll see. Uh, until then, I'm just going to keep doing my stuff. Uh, keep doing Patricia's show. Keep doing Strange World. Uh, keep doing uh, you know the, the videos as much as I can on, on YouTube. I'm going to do a new series eventually, uh, which is going to be more of a boiled down how you approach friends and family with the flat earth i'm going to try to to make some, some talking points that are so easy to understand that at the very least they won't just you know be met with with hostility that'd be nice uh that and well, still trying just to in case there's any uh british press we live with optimism <laughs> in this household yeah. um can you give out maybe some contact details uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up if that's good for you. oh yeah yeah sure uh contact details uh, the website is enclosedworld.com my email, my direct email address is m sergeant. That's m s a r g e n t twenty three at comcast dot net. Yes, I still have one of those. Uh, at least I don't have my old AOL address anymore. Uh, my phone number three zero three four nine four six six three one. It will probably go to voicemail because that phone just never stops ringing. And uh, yeah, if you want, if if you're ever in doubt, just Google flat Earth clues. You will find it. There's a lot of people mirroring them because I I don't monetize them. So people, if you if you want to monetize the flat Earth clues, there's been some people that have had a lot of hits off them. Hey, go for it. I don't care. It's great. Uh, and just keep making flat Earth stuff. Keep it positive. And and I love the people that do flat Earth music. Anyone that sends me a flat Earth song, I will see if I can turn it into something. Superb. Mark Sargent, you have been an absolutely sub superb guest. Thank you ever so much for being on Flat Earth UK Live. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was my pleasure. I'm glad to have you here. To all of you who have been uh, in the comments, I've been vaguely keeping an eye on what you've been saying, along with uh, Tim Osman, who's been commenting away nicely. Uh, thank you very much to all of the people who tuned in to Flat Earth UK Live. I've been Nathan Oakley. I will see you all in the next video.